Joining us to discuss the management of lockdown in Nigeria is Chinan Yumbao, who's a Uku, a technology consultant, and also Olamide Udoma Ejo, an urban activist. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us on News of the Hour. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Olamide, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing well, doing good. Thanks, trying to stay sane. That's good to know. Now, what if you are professionals in your different fields as an urban a activist and also a technology uh, consultant? Do, do you think the challenges of COVID-19 was something we could have planned for? Allow me, let me go with you first. Um, yes, there's definitely something we could have planned for in terms of what, in terms of, let's say, reducing the death rate or in terms of reducing the infectious uh, rate, infection rate. Um, but to be honest, I think it's it's something that uh, we we should blame my field, urban planners and urban developers, and also people in governance and government, um, because the decisions that are made where priorities uh, are put um, have not really been around health, the health sector, been around making sure that contagious diseases um, are not spread quickly, um, and that, so there's a lot of stuff that we could have done, um, but unfortunately. Um, from, from the field of urban planning, we have not done a good job. We haven't um, provided the guidance um, that could have actually helped the spread of this virus, um, reduce the spread of this virus. All right, Chinaya, what about you as a technology consultant? Do you think the way technology to approach we, we could have imbibed during the course of this virus? Of this virus? I would say definitely yes. Um, we always start from data and what does the data tell us? And historically, pandemics have occurred uh, periodically throughout human history. And this one was actually predicted. I mean, uh, people like President Obama pointed this out about five years ago, that the U.S. needed to prepare. In the same way, countries across the globe needed to do exactly the same thing, prepare. Mm -hmm. The data was, 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 was clear. It was visible to everyone. Um, that there was a possibility that there was going to be another viral epidemic. We had had SARS, we had had Ebola, and clearly another one was on this whole way. And according to the data, there will be more up ahead. So clearly the, the, were, um, the, the forecasts were clear, and we just needed to plan ahead. Unfortunately, planning ahead is not what uh, most uh, of the world does, apparently, as the pandemic has shown. Yeah. But I think, I think going forward, I mean, the, um, the, the Indian writer Arundhati Roy has said that historically pandemics enable societies to reset themselves to the world, to think and reimagine a new world. And I think that's really what the, what the challenge is for us now, to walk through this portal um, that the pandemic has presented and think about the post-COVID-19 world and what it should look like, learning from all the mistakes of the past. Now, observing the lockdown implementation so far, what effective and not so effective measures and practices have you not noticed? Chinay, I'll, I'll start with you and then Olamide will take it up from there. Well, I, I, I really, the numbers again are, are a bit alarming because uh, clearly Nigeria is a country with a lot of contradictions. One of the biggest ones is the, is the, uh, is the number of people who, who live in poverty, which is estimated about 112 million. Of this 112 million, we have we have on our social register only about 12 million, which means that 100 million people are dependent on the rest of society, literally, for on the government and the rest of society to be able to find uh, a means of living. So what, once you implement a lockdown, these are the most vulnerable, the people who are actually most affected by this are the poor and, uh, and the vulnerable. And we haven't adequately provided for them. So the lockdown definitely is going to affect them much more. In cities like Lagos, I mean, um, Lagos is classified as a fragile city. The concept of urban fragility, which just looks at, at, at uh, when you have rural to urban migration and you've got certain pressures in the urban area, certain fragilities start to show themselves in terms of uh, homeless people, unemployed people, uh, people who are not taken care of by the security systems, adequately covered by security, um, and those kind of indices. Well, Lagos is growing, like Abuja is growing at about 6.5, 6.2%, right, in terms of growth. Uh, Port Harcourt about 5.1%, and I think Lagos is somewhere in between the two. So at that pace, clearly, by the year 2050, all our cities are going to be twice, and that's when we have to think about the impact of viruses and living so closely together and what that means and how we take care of our people. All right, Alamide, what about you? What, what would you say, observing the lockdown implementation so far, what effective and also effective measures and practices have you, have you noted? Um, well, to be honest, I don't think the lockdown has been um, 
not everybody is, is, is locked down, let me just put it that way. And there are kind of three categories. Some people who are, yes, staying at home, not going out until they need an essential uh, good, maybe food or medicine. There's also a group who cannot be locked down because um, they don't have, they don't have um, for example, I think Jane mentioned um, some, some communities, low-income communities, where they are in you know, rooms where nine people are staying there. They can't be locked down. They're already in quite uh, close proximity with their with their neighbors, with their household. Um, and then there, and then obviously those who need a daily income. Again, they need to find money to eat, to to thrive, to do anything. Um, they need to feed their children. So that's another group that really are not um, on lockdown. Then the third group are people who are just not really believing in what is happening. So therefore, they are just kind of deciding that, no, they don't want to stay at home, okay. and, and, the, and the virus is, it can continue okay. to spread that way. Olamide, um, Olamide, the things yeah. I think have worked... Oh, so, yeah, sorry, mm -hmm. let me cut you in. Olamide Edjo, now, you are an urban activist, all right? So in the course of your job, how could planning have eased some of these rough experiences? As an urban activist? Yeah, so, for example, yeah, so planning is really about space, right? It's about yes. spatial uh, development. And when you're thinking about where does where do residential um, where where does the residential properties are where are the hospitals where are the uh, the health services where are the security services you need to plan a city in that way thinking in that way how does mobility work how can you get from from your office uh, to your house and so if you are not planning a city thinking of all these things and then putting a health aspect into this as well as well as an economic aspect into this. That is why you see our city kind of uh, in a bit of a, a disaster, because our, which is why I said is the urban planner has really failed uh, Lagos, Lagos uh, as a state, as a city, because we haven't planned it well enough to actually uh, be resilient towards uh, these kind of epidemics, or even things like flooding um, and variety, th variety of things that we are facing now, um, and that we will continue to face as we grow as a city. Um, so that's what I'm saying, like urban planners, their role is really to think about the space of the city and really try to figure out how do we stop an epidemic like this spreading and how do we make sure that everybody has um, the access to healthcare, access to, to affordable healthcare. And that's where kind of governance now comes in because we're talking about, you know, um, safety, security and accessibility to various things. All right, Chinaya. Specifically, um, on touching yes, on the issue of distribution of palliatives and, and the cry of some to have a more user-friendly version of lockdown, what other roles could we have followed? Well, I, I want to I want to pick up on where where Alamide left off. You know, oh. there's there's a, there's a massive role for technology in our society, which is underplayed and and probably underimplemented. And in some way, in some ways, it, it we are where we are because we've ignored technology. And and this goes from basic things like having science R and D into in the lab where we can actually uh, study these viruses and come up with vaccines and certain cures all the way through the way that we live. And whether the, the, you see, the, the cities are fundamentally economic machines. Yeah. And people will gravitate to the economic machine that actually enables them the best opportunity to achieve the best of themselves. And so you have this unequal draw in certain cities in Lagos, and there will constantly be this rural to urban migration based on push and pull factors. Okay. And it's important to understand that this is not going to stop. Therefore, the role that we need to be thinking about from a technology perspective is how does technology disrupt that? What can we do to enable certain uh, changes in the pattern in which we live? For instance, do we have to have as many cars on the road as we currently have? What if people were commuting? Today, everyone is, is, is working from home. Most people are trying to work from home. Why do we need to have a virus to force us to create the infrastructure to be able to do that? If we had the infrastructure in place, there'll be so much less pressure on the systems. If you can work remotely, we don't all have to live in close co contact with each other. I mean, uh, three quarters of Lagos doesn't have to necessarily live inside Lagos. And, uh, and, and so you start to think about that. And these are some of the things that the urban planners may be at fault, but ultimately the primary failure, I think, has been to miss, not understand that we've transited into the 21st century. Yeah. There are challenges with the 21st century, but there are huge opportunities. And what leads that is technology. A massive deployment of technology would have kept children in schools and learning. A massive deployment of technology would have allowed people to actually uh, work from home and not congregate in places. Today we go to churches, we attend mass, we attend mosques, we don't, we know, uh, services, we, we, we don't 
congregate in a single area. So, so there, there has been a shift. And I think post-COVID-19, not just in Nigeria, but all over the world, people are going to have to understand that urban centers will buckle under the pressure of population. And we must find a way to distribute our people, distribute our resources, and at the same time enable people to be able to live effective lives from wherever they are, productive and aspiring to the best that they can possibly be. It doesn't have to be in the way that we currently live, creating slums that are difficult to manage viruses, healthcare services, distribution of palliatives where they're necessary, all of these things from e-health to e-commerce to e-transportation to everything. This is all the role that technology has to play. And that's why I feel unlike Alami Day, it's not the urban planner's fault. It's a failure of technology to deploy into our cities that okay. has resulted in the situation that we're at. All right, right. Chinenye Mba Uzouku, technology consultant, and also Alami Day Udoma Ejo, urban activists. It's been a pleasure having you guys join us and for your contribution on News on the Hour. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank for having you. us. Happy day. Bye. Bye.